There being none, we will move on, and I will call Senator Cortman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the rules for remote participation of Senate uh, proceedings recommended by the Procedure Committee in its uh, first report of 2020 have effect during the sittings of the Senate from 24 August to 30 September 2020. Uh, Mr. President, uh, this sitting fortnight will be the first time uh, that senators will be able to participate in proceedings remotely, and uh, this is um, obviously in the context of um, the ongoing effect uh, around Australia of the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic and a desire to ensure uh, that uh, our workplace uh, in the Senate uh, is as COVID safe as possible while facilitating participation uh, by uh, all senators uh, as appropriate. Uh, the rules that have been agreed to by the Procedure Committee uh, have been developed on the principle that the proceedings of the Senate are to be managed in the Senate uh, by uh, those uh, senators uh, present uh, in the Senate chamber. Um, importantly, uh, senators participating remotely can participate in any matter that is before the chair but are limited to being able to only move amendments and requests for amendments to legislation and committee of the whole. So the general principle for remote participation uh, is uh, that those uh, colleagues uh, who are participating remotely uh, will be able to participate in relation to any uh, issue that is before the chair but can't themselves bring matters before the chair uh, with the exception of um, amendments to legislation in Committee of the Whole. So, uh, Mr. President, I think uh, the measures are well understood and I commend them uh, to the Chamber. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'll have more to say subsequently, but I would just uh, make a couple of points. First, to thank the Procedure Committee for their work uh, in um, collaboratively preparing the rules uh, for participation uh, in these, these proceedings. Uh, I would emphasise that the rules reflect the principle of uh, the primacy of parliament and that proceedings have to be managed in the chamber uh, and hence uh, the uh, parameters for remote participation. Uh, I would also uh, emphasise that uh, these are interim arrangements uh, and we would be keen to ensure that uh, the Procedure Committee reviewed the operation of the order after the fortnight and thank you for your, your assistance on this and in particular can I thank the Deputy President for shepherding this work through. Thank you. Senator Seawitt. Thank you. I rise to make a, uh, I'll seek to make a contribution to the, uh, yeah. the debate. Um, the Greens have always said that the Parliament can and should proceed as long as the health advice says it's safe to do so. That's why we did not support the suspension of Parliament effectively for six months back in March. It is our view that there, there remained other ways to manage Parliament sitting and that a suspension was not justified. The Greens have been calling on the government to allow for remote participation in Parliament for some time. We, we are disappointed that it has taken this long to get to the place that we are now. It is clear that, like other workplaces across Australia, the federal parliament can and should continue to operate. I will, of course, acknowledge that we have all uh, been very active and working very hard uh, remotely and in our offices and participating in endless uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, WebEx, whatever other uh, virtual, uh, sorry, Skype, whatever other virtual medium there is, we have been using. But the parliament has been not has not been sitting. Other workplaces have been adopting uh, and adapting uh, since the beginning of the year, yet the parliament has taken this long to get to this place. Um, we should not have missed um, the two important weeks of parliament at the beginning of the month, simply because we didn't have this process in place. However, we are very pleased that it is now in place. And as you can see, um, some of our green senators are up there on the screen, and I can't from here see who the other person is. Um, senators should be able to carry out their duties remotely. Things like moving motions are an important part of representing our constituencies. So the Greens, as noted in the Procedure Committee report that was tabled on Friday, um, are disappointed that senators th and, uh, are uh, excluded from participating in some of the processes that operate in this place. We do understand that meeting in parliament um, and uh, section 20 of the constitution is very important, but we are disappointed that some of the processes that are available when you are here in the Senate are not available to those participating remotely, except for 
Um, uh, we do appreciate that people can participate, and senators can participate in community of the whole. Uh, sorry, committee of the whole. Um, that is very important, um, but we're disappointed that they can't participate in some of the other processes that are available uh, in the Senate. And we believe that um, we'd like to see during the review process that Senator Wong mentioned. We would like to ensure that we look at how we can uh, open the process up to. Uh, able to participate in some of the wider processes that are available to the senators in the chamber. Thank you. The question is the motion moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. With that, I'd like to formally welcome our colleagues attending remotely for the first time. Now that the Senate has adopted the rules for remote attendance, rather than go through a series of procedures, I simply ask that those attending remotely strictly follow the advice of the chair. Senators will be very familiar with this system, having used it extensively for dozens of committee hearings since April. And I'd like to thank officials from the Department of Parliamentary Service for their extensive work over this period with officials of the Department of the Senate to ensure those committee hearings and now this remote attendance can function so smoothly. Senators, there are several issues I need to address to the Senate now that we have allowed the remote participation and commenced this sitting. First, the COVID safe measures adopted earlier this year regarding chamber operations remain in place. Other measures have been instituted regarding building operations, including recommendations about mask use in certain areas, and I urge senators to familiarise themselves with the statements made by the Speaker and I last Monday and last Friday. Second, the sittings are scheduled for earlier this month. On 18 July, I made a statement advising that the sittings scheduled for the weeks of 4 and 11 August would not take place. This followed my receipt of a request to that effect made by Senate leaders representing more than three quarters of senators. That request reflected the health situation then unfolding in Victoria and advice from the Commonwealth Acting Chief Medical Officer. I wrote to all senators on 20 July confirming my statement. This is the first time scheduled sitting sittings have been set aside in this way. After seeking advice, I took the view that the principles that had been applied by my predecessors in taking action to delay the commencement of sittings were also relevant here. There are numerous precedents for presidents altering the commencement of sittings in light of extraordinary circumstances or, as occurred on June 12 this year, for reasons connected to the conduct of Senate business. These have occurred with the concurrence of senators, demonstrating the principle that the Senate controls its own meetings. A key factor in my decision on this occasion was that the request was effectively made on behalf of more than three quarters of senators, so that if the scheduled sitting had gone ahead, it would not be possible to establish or maintain a quorum. This particular point is critical, as despite different arrangements in the other place occasionally attracting disproportionate attention, it remains the case that the government cannot unilaterally cancel a sitting of the Senate. In my view, this high threshold of such action being taken only when a quorum would not be possible protects the autonomy of the Senate to determine its own meetings. I table the statement and the health advice. Finally, as I flagged in my statement of 6 August, when announcements were made specifically impacting senators and members from Victoria, when we next met, I would raise the issue of the effect of controls on movement of senators undertaking parliamentary business in the Senate. Let me say at the outset, this should not be seen in any way as a criticism of health officials who I and many others have worked with over this period. I would like to express my personal and professional thanks to them for the assistance they have provided senators and officials during this challenging time. A very difficult situation in dealing with the unique work of senators has been made more manageable by their professionalism and understanding. And I would particularly like to thank the officials in the ACT and Commonwealth Health Departments, with whom a number of us have worked very closely. However, these controls on movement raise and occasionally challenge an important principle, and I feel a responsibility to bring this directly to the Senate. It does not necessarily need to be addressed, addressed immediately, but to let it pass without mention risks a precedent being established through simple inertia or acceptance. The restrictions on movements currently in place under various state and territory health orders due to the COVID-19 pandemic are now clearly impacting the ability of senators to undertake undertake parliamentary work and, in some cases, even attend parliamentary proceedings. Earlier this year, there was an order in place in South Australia that affected South Australian senators by imposing requirements for quarantine upon return from a sitting of parliament. This directly impacted the ability of parliamentarians and office holders to undertake their work, in some cases directly related to parliamentary proceedings. This was imposed by officials of the Government of South Australia, that is, the executive. 
As part of our ongoing work to resolve this, legal advice was sought, but the issue was resolved after productive informal discussions without the need for the Speaker and myself to formally intervene. The recent announcement of Victorian parliamentarians being required to undergo a period of quarantine and testing, in some cases also for their families, as a condition of attending parliament represented a new imposition, notably one I am not aware has any precedent at the Commonwealth level. Again, this was an imposition of the executive, in this case both the Commonwealth and ACT levels. We have now seen officials of the executives of two states, Queensland and Tasmania, effectively impose new quarantine requirements upon senators returning from a sitting of parliament though th through the removal of exemptions or classifications previously in place. The Western Australian government has also removed a broad-based exemption applying to members of the Commonwealth Parliament, although placing less onerous restrictions on returning parliamentarians than Queensland or Tasmania. These quarantine requirements do not prevent travel to attend a subsequent sitting of parliament, but they do restrict various other activities they may undertake. I also tabled the letter I received from the Queensland Chief Health Officer, which I circulated to senators last week and copies of the letters sent by the Tasmanian State Controller to Senators for Tasmania and the Western Australian State Emergency Coordinator to Senators for Western Australia that have both been forwarded to me. These letters outline the changed arrangements for Senators from those states. These are not normal times. We have both imposed and accepted controls placed on citizens that are unique in our own lifetimes. So many of our fellow Australians have had to find new ways to work. But even in my hometown of Melbourne, under stage four lockdown, at the moment it is accepted that some people must travel to work. There is an element of the work of parliament and parliamentarians that is unique and cannot entirely be replicated remotely. While some elements of this can now be addressed through remote attendance and participation, at this stage that is a limited facility in that a vote cannot be exercised. And surely exercising a vote is a key and fundamental element of participating as a member of parliament. The right of those elected to attend and participate in parliament is an ancient one. For good reason, the ability of others, including the executive, to restrict this has always been limited. The powers and immunities that enable and secure the work of the two Commonwealth Houses belong to the Houses themselves by constitutional design, a design which ensures that the Senate in particular can undertake its functions with an appropriate degree of independence. The ability to scrutinise the executive and participate in legislative activity activity is unarguably even more critical in times of crisis due to the extraordinary powers being delegated, granted and exercised by officials and the executive. In the current pandemic, an important principle is at stake, notably the ability of the executive or its officers, no matter the jurisdiction, to control attendance at parliament or constrain the work of members of parliament when it is directly related to parliamentary proceedings. A further complicating factor is the claimed ability in some cases to use discretion to, term, to determine which senators or members are allowed to attend parliament or have burdens placed upon them. In the case of the ACT, permits were granted to ministers to attend events prior to the sitting of parliament, but the attendance of senators and members to a session of parliament on the same basis was denied and claimed to be prohibited. In the case of Tasmania, the correspondence from the State Controller outlines consideration of exemption from the quarantine requirements on a case-by-case -case basis. This claimed discretion is particularly problematic on the grounds of differential treatment of members of the executive in the first instance and lack of transparency around the equality of treatment of senators in the second. The explanation that the medical risk posed by the entry of a single minister is lower and therefore allowable, as opposed to a group attending an actual session of parliament, is a circular one with a dangerous consequence in that it establishes a preference for members of the executive attending events not directly related to parliamentary proceedings, but then effectively claims the power to control or prohibit parliamentarians' attendance at actual parliamentary proceedings. Unilateral action by executives, whether Commonwealth, state or territory, that impede the performance of Commonwealth parliamentary functions are problematic from a constitutional perspective. This remains the case even where as is the case with border restrictions and quarantine requirements imposed at a state and territory level, that action is founded on or in aid of genuine public health advice and goals. However, these problems may be largely avoided where the requisite action, in this case the response to the public health advice, is developed cooperatively by the institutions concerned. The approach taken during this public health crisis will doubtless set precedents that will be looked to in the future. We all know and indeed support the public health messages that outline the need for caution as this pandemic will likely be with us for some time. But the National Parliament is a critical part of government, 
which we are relying on through various agencies and experts to manage our response and care for the health and interests of our fellow Australians. In my view, simple acquiescence to these new assertions of control by officials of the executive of Commonwealth, state or territories, including somewhat extraordinarily the territory established at the seat, as the seat of government and that we are constitutionally required to assemble in, poses a risk in that we cannot envisage how it may be used or potentially even misused at a future time in circumstances we cannot imagine. I doubt any of us imagined the current circumstances only a year ago. Principles not defended in difficult times are in effect mere customs or conveniences. As I said earlier, this issue does not need to be addressed immediately, but in my view as your president, I must bring this issue to your attention so as not to inadvertently allow a precedent to be established by default. I lay the matter before the Senate for its consideration at a time of its choosing. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I <coughs> rise to speak briefly in relation to your statement. Uh, can I start at the outset by indicating that we appreciate that you have taken your responsibilities in this office as encompassing uh, some guardianship of this institution, and we, we respect that and we value it. We uh, endorse in particular the point you make that the ability to scrutinise the executive and participate in legislative activity is unarguably even more critical in time of crisis due to the extraordinary powers being delegated, granted and exercised by officials and the executive. Put simply, uh, Mr President, Parliamentary democracy needs a parliament. It's not an optional extra. Uh, and ceding or untrammeled power to the executive is not who we are, and it's also risky. So I place on record our disappointment and concern as to some of how we have got here, and in particular. Uh, the way in which Mr Morrison sidelined a working group which was working towards resolving how it would be that this parliament could meet safely. As you might recall, the presiding officers, government and opposition managers of business, chief medical officers, were meeting to ensure this was done collaboratively and, regrettably, the Prime Minister unilaterally commissioned advice and sidelined the working group. The parliament and the executive are separate institutions, and we each have a separate and unique responsibility within our system of government. The executive ought not and cannot interfere with the parliament. Given this, and in light of your statement, the opposition invites the presiding officers to consider for the purposes of future sittings the merit of obtaining independent medical advice to enable the parliament to do its job, and we again reiterate that the procedure committee process by which the virtual parliament uh, aspects of the parliament for remote attendance uh, has been agreed demonstrates the capacity of this parliament to act collaboratively uh, in response to that advice. And as I said, Mr. President, we thank you for uh, your statement and acknowledge again your guardianship of this institution at these times. Thanks, Senators.